Um, typically, you guys engage more when your cameras are open. So for those who did, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so we're recording. So I'll jump into my notes for the reading. Um, this is the book that you guys engaged for this week. It's called Of Mules and Men. The author is Zornel Hurston. Uh, she's a world-renowned um, author. Um, one of her more famous texts is Their Eyes Are Watching God. And um, yeah, so this is one of her texts. Let me give you a little bit of background about Zornel Hurston. Um, she's an anthropologist. So for those familiar with the field of anthropology, this text is centered within that study, within that field. Um, she received her BA from, sorry, excuse me, she received her AA from Howard University. Um, she received her BA in anthropology from Bernard College of Women in Columbia. And then she studied anthropology in Columbia at the University of Columbia under um, France Boas. And for those familiar with anthropology, again, um, that name, France Boas, should be familiar. He's like the forefather of American anthropology. Um, her focus as it pertains to anthropology is Caribbean and American folklore. Hence, this book here, Mules of Men, it's a book of, of American folklore. So um, the book itself was published in 1935. Um, it's a collection of folklore. Um, it's gathered in Eatonville and Polk County, Florida, along with New Orleans. So this is the area where she was able to cultivate um, these, these stories. Uh, December 14th, 1927, she began the research for this book. Uh, so frameworks, right? I, I'm really big on this thing called a theoretical framework. So for this section, for this reading, for this lecture, the theoretical framework that we'll be working through is entitled um, Funds of Knowledge. This, this should be familiar to you guys. I, I mentioned Funds of Knowledge before, um, but write this down. I want to provide you a definition. So Funds of Knowledge, as defined by Tara Yoso, um, T-A-R-A, Y-O-S-S-O -S -S is the um, intellect who cultivated this theory. So funds of knowledge is how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed from generation to generation by family and community. So again, how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed from generation to generation by family and community. One more time, how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed from generation to generation by family and community. So this is this um, theoretical framework, funds of knowledge. Does anybody need me to repeat that again or are you guys good? All right, so I'm assuming you're good. Um, so another thing for me, as I read this, I thought it was important to understand what folklore is, right? So if we're gonna read folklore, it's important to understand and define what it is, right? So via Webster's Dictionary, folklore is an expressive body of culture shared by a particular group of people encompassing the traditions common to that culture. So one more time, folklore is an expressive body of culture shared by a particular group of people encompassing the traditions common to that culture. So this is what this idea of folklore is, okay? And really folklore is a, um, a component of funds of knowledge, right? So if funds of knowledge is how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed down from generation to generation, right? And we define folklore as expressive body of culture, that's a component of funds of knowledge, right? So folklore is a way that funds of knowledge manifests itself. Does that make sense? Um, so to get into the text, uh, so it was chapter nine of the book, or excuse me, chapter eight of the book. And, and they start off, y'all been telling and lying, right? So this idea uh, of telling and lying, just kind of speaking and articulating these stories, right? So this becomes a centerpiece for what she wants to deal with. Um, and these are also core aspects of the oral tradition. So I, I want you for a moment to think back to the Glissant reading. And he says, the open confrontation between the written word and the cry that was stifled, the cry of orality that was stifled, right? So think about that. So what he's bringing us attentive to is the distinction and the tensions between the oral and the written, right? This is the first con um, contention he says. Um, historically, 
African culture has not been recognized and given its proper value because they say it's not written down, right? You cannot trace the history of African culture through written text. This is the argument that they place against African culture. By and large, African culture is an oral culture. It's a culture that's steeped in the oral tradition, right? That's why we're in an oral traditions course, right? So what Zornel Hurston is seeking to do is to take these stories that are orally transferred and put them on paper. Right. And so she went to um, Franz Boaz and let him know that she was looking to do this study in her hometown. And she wants to put on paper these stories and these folklores to give them their credit, their value. Right. So it's the it's the it's the um, answering of the tension between the oral tradition and the written tradition. Right. And she's trying to assert that the written the oral tradition is just as important as the written tradition. So this is what's in, in play here. Um, I was also attentive to the way that the elders in the story, um, they were referred to as dad. Like, so one of the characters name was Dad Boykin, right? And that is also something that you find within the African traditions as well. Um, if someone's an elder, uh, you would refer to them as Baba, right? And Baba is just an African term for father, right? So I, I, the reverence for the elders. And if you notice, the reverence, sorry, the elders were predominantly the ones who were telling the stories, right? And the youth would ask him, well, tell us how to do that, right? So this is that dynamic at play um, that you also see within Maladoma Patrice Somme's story, right? The reverence for the elders. And you see this in these um, stories here. Um, then, so we have the story of the bear, the lion, and then the king of the world, right, John? So to me, why that story becomes important, it's a story of subversion. Does anybody not know what subversion means? Okay. Can anybody explain what is subversion? What does it mean to be subversive? So think about, um, think about the story, right? Let's see if I could kind of find a um, excerpt that will speak to the subversion. One second. Okay, here we go. So on page um, 132 towards the middle of the page, um, the section starting with the bear. The bear was scared or scared. The lion was going to eat him while he was all cut and bleeding nearly to death. So we hollered and said, please don't touch me, bear lion. I done met the king of the world and he didn't cut me all up. The lion's got his bristles all up and clasped, and clasped down at the bear. Don't you lay there and tell me you done met the king of the world and not be talking about me. I'll tear you to pieces. Oh, don't touch me, bird lion. Please leave me alone so I can get well. Well, you don't call nobody the king of the world but me. But bear lion, I done met him. The king's shown up. Wait till you see him and you will see I'm right. Nah, I won't neither. Show him to me and I'll show you how much king he is. So I'm gonna stop there. So think about what's at play here, right? The bear met the king of the world, got stabbed in the ribs. So he's laying on the ground recuperating, right? But he knows that the lion has more power and authority than him, right? So if the lion comes, it's, it's the bear's ass and the bear knows this, right? So let me think of a way to position myself to where I'm not going to be eaten, right? So he outsmarts the lion and gets the lion to focus on the king of the world, the man, right? So that's subversion. So subversion is the way to outsmart, outwit either your enemy um, and someone's of authority for, of, over you, right? Um, it's like fire. Kind of. So what would it be more like Eshayu is like, um, so the police, right? That's, so, that's an authority figure, okay? And, and I'll give you this example. Um, say you're out and you're chilling, hypothetical, right? You have a warrant on you, right? So everybody knows how a warrant plays out. They run your name, you got a warrant, they're taking your ass to jail, right? So um, you know you have a warrant. You're not driving the car, but the car is pulled over, right? So naturally they come out, get the information from the driver, they ask you your information. So what you do, instead of giving them your full name, 
you give them your brother's name or your sister's name, right? Because you know your brother or your sister, they don't have a warrant, right? So that move allowed you to keep out, to stay out of jail, right? So you subverted the police officer by outsmarting him and allowing you to stay out of police custody, right? So it's being able to smart, outsmart, outwit, outthink those who are superior over you. Um, you see this a lot in the enslavement plantation institution, right? Um, slave in the, the formerly enslaved would do things like, um, you know, work real slow, right? That's an act of subversion where the institution of enslavement is about getting the most productivity in the amount of time available, right? So instead of trying to work real hard and fast, I'm gonna work slow, right? And then also, so maybe you're tasked to, to pick like 30 bales of cotton a day, right? This is what they, this is the, the pace that you, they want you at, right? So what you'll do is you'll only pick 15, right? So they think the fastest that you could go is the 15, right? But you could probably do 30 if you wanted to, but I'm not gonna show them that I'm able to put out that amount of production because I don't wanna kill myself working hard, right? This is subversion, right? Um, it's the, you have a 15 minute break, but you might take 25 minutes on your break, right? Clock in or, or the, I'm gonna take my lunch break, I'm gonna eat, then I'm gonna go take my lunch break and get my full time to myself, right? So you're subverting the, the, the time clock that you have to punch into. Right, so it's just outsmarting, outwitting, and outthinking those who are superior over you. This is this act of subversion. So this story between the bear, the lion, and the man is a story of subversion. How do you subvert those who are are more powerful over you? But you have to you have to do that by outthinking them. Okay, um, and then they give you the uh, the story about how to eat fish. Right, and, and he's telling you the proper way how to eat fish. You take the fork and you put the fork in the back of the fish and you bring it from the back all the way up to the head so you can separate the meat from the bone, right? Uh, you don't go into the party and you start touching all the fish on the platter. You get you a piece of cornbread first. You watch and see which fish you wanna grab and then you get the one that you want, right? So to me, this is the significance of knowledge being passed down, right? And it may be trivial, right? Like how important is it really to eat fish? But the importance is the knowledge being passed down from one generation to the next, right? How to get the cold off your back. He's showing you how to warm yourself. He's showing the younger generation how to situate themselves by a fire to get the cold off their back, passing knowledge down from one generation to the next. Um, and then once you get through the bear, the lion, the man, um, instructions on how to eat fish, on how to keep yourself warm, the preacher arrives on the scene, right? And, and to me, at this point, it takes a real, almost weird turn, but keep in mind what she's doing, she's just articulating real time events, right? She's literally going to this community in Florida, hanging out with them for months and writing down what she witnesses, right? So far as the preacher's concerned, right? And to me, why that becomes important what is the preacher talking about? What is his sermon about? Did anybody pick that up? It's about um, about uh, how the woman is made, and and it said I read that it said something about the woman being made by the side of the rib of a man, yep. and also about um, that it's not made from the head so that it can be a leader, or from the feet so that it can be stepped on as well. Yeah, that's so, what I understood. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Dulce. Um, we in Women's Month, so with that, how they articulate that, I don't personally agree with. Right, um, I have no problem with women being able to lead. I think our society would be better off if we had more women leading. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but Dulce is absolutely right, right? And, and what we know is that the preacher is pulling from Genesis, right? The Book of Genesis in the Bible, um, chapter two, verse twenty-one. This is what we know. And really what this is, is not only the story of how women was made, it's a story of the creation of the world, right? He says he shook his hair and diamonds fell out and um, we have stars in the sky, right? So it's a story of creation. To me, that's another methodological move, right? Because folklore also helps you make sense of the world, right? Especially when you look at African folklore, There's a, I have an um, African folklore book that I read to my kids at night before bed. 
and it will tell you things like how the why the pig's tail is is circular right so another aspect of folklore is to help you make sense of happenings in the world right so she has a meta method at play and she's because she has a preacher coming in and delivering a servant a sermon excuse me about how the world was create created right so there's no greater thing to have an understanding of like yeah you can have an understanding of how to eat fish you can have an understanding of how to warm yourself when you've been in the cold all day but there's no fundamental um greater understanding than how the world came to be and how the world was cultivated and she and i don't think it's on accident that she ends this story with another story about how the world with a, with a preacher delivering a sermon about how the world was created right so to me those are some of the points of emphasis i found um in the book Another thing that I'll say before I end my portion, um, there's a duality at play, right? There's a double layer at play when engaging this text. And, and really all texts, when you read, you can read from two levels, right? It's the what, what is being said within these pages? What is the author wanting us to think about? What is the author arguing, right? Also centered around this question of thesis. Um, and then there's the how. How does the author deliver this text? How does the author get us to think about certain things? For me, what's important in this reading is not the what, but the how, right? And how she goes about it, her method is extremely important in this text. And, and um, so I want you guys to one, think about the distinctions when reading between the what, right? And the how. So when you, I think we're reading um, James Baldwin next week. So when you read the story from James Baldwin next week, read it for what he's saying, right? And, and try to um, try to compartmentalize the two. So you're reading and you're gathering what he's saying, but also be attentive to how he's saying it, right? The moves that he makes when he's writing, um, because that also allows you to be an effective writer, right? Because if you could understand the how, then you could use that how for your own work, right? The what, you may not agree with the what, but the, the how may be useful for you. So it's good as thinkers and as scholars to be able to situate and delineate between the what in a writing and then the how does they produce that writing, right? So I, I want you to think about that. Um, so I'll put myself on pause. Uh, we'll jump into the fishbowl. One second. Is there anybody that wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? I will. Dulce. Anyone else? So then I'll, I'll call that random. Remember, if you went already, then you're good. Um, you are expected to fishbowl twice a semester, and then you have one time to pass. So if I call on you and you're not ready, just let me know. You know, Professor, I'm, I'm cool this time. Uh, you have to get me next time, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I'll call two more people at random. Uh, Yasmin, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I'll go. Okay. Thank you. And one more. Um, Jack, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, I will. I will pass today. Okay. Um, let's see. Kendra, are you prepared to fishbowl today? I've already went twice, but no, no. If you already went twice, you're good. Don't worry about it. Um, all right, Gabriella, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, I've been twice as well. I'm usually okay. in class A. Okay, so then no worries. Um, Denise, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, I don't really have anything written down, but I can just free. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it could be what I discussed in the in um, my short lecture. It could be something on the breakout rooms or just anything on the top of your head. Okay, so okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. I'll I'll go today. All right. So we have Dulce, Yasmin, and Denise. Um, whoever wants to start, it's on you. I'll start. 
Um, okay, so from when I was reading, I didn't really understand it. Um, but what I understood from what the professor said was that the story of the lion and the bear was like a story that that is subverted or a method that they use that was subverted, which outsmarts the other person or the person that is superior. Uh, the story of the fish was is like significance of knowledge and I would say also um, obedience or it gives you advice towards or leads you. Um, and then and then he was saying that us as readers were supposed to try to understand how the author or how the author explains or is trying to get her point across. And I believe that she gives ex the way she causes or gives her main points is by giving as examples using different stories that allows her to cause or give her main points. Right, thank you, Dosa. Uh, next. I'll go next. Um, going back to what Dosa said, I agree. I, at first, I was kind of confused on the reading. I think it was like the language that kind of threw me off. And I kind of mentioned this in my, um, my the breakout rooms. I feel like the folks so was a good way to like share the story, um, but the language kind of threw me off. And then going to the fish story, it kind of reminded me of the, of the Bible on like passing on knowledge on how like teach me, like I could give you a fish or like I could teach you how to fish which would like be better, I guess. That's what it reminded me of. And then, Oh, that's it. Sorry. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Denise? Okay, so from what I understood from the reading was that um, the older people or like the wiser knew the like what was real and they didn't really preach or brag about it, but instead they taught it to those who listened and thought of fools for those who like didn't. Um, and then in the breakout room, we kind of just talked about how it, the stories uh, resembled how generations pass down like morals or like lessons in life. Okay. Um, so one common thing that, that I've heard is, is the the language that was used, right? The dialect that was used caused some confusion. Um, how many of y'all read the reading out loud? Uh, Natalia, if you don't mind, do you feel that reading out loud kind of helped you understand it a little bit better or did it make it still confusing? No, it made it um, much better actually. When I was reading it to myself, I I still got like I still understood it, but it made more sense when I read it out loud. Yeah, yeah. There's a um. You, does everybody want to understand when I say um, it's phonetic, right? There's a, a phonetic spelling to the way that that is writ written, right? She spells it how it sounds, right? So with it being phonetic, um, reading it out loud becomes important, so you can hear what they're trying to say, right? And, and like even. So how, how he talks about the bear, right? And he, um, I'm sorry, uh, the bear calls the lion, br lion, B-R-E-R, -E right? And reading that to yourself, it really won't, you won't really catch what she's trying to say. But really for me, when I read out loud, I translated to like br lion, right? It's, it's like it's the same sounding type of thing, right? So when you read it out loud, it becomes important. So this speaks to this notion or this idea of method, right? She chose to write the text like this. She has her PhD. She could write in standard, standard English vernacular. She could have wrote this in an academic language, you know, in an academic language, but she chose to write it in this fashion. And what's also, I don't know if you guys um, paid attention, but so there's what's in the quotes that she writes as Ebonics, right? But then there's also her own narrative writing that's written in Ebonics as well, right? So from a standpoint of method, she could have very well put what's in quotes in Ebonics and then wrote her notes as the narrator, narrator 
in regular English, right? But she chose purposely to write all of his texts in this type of vernacular. What do you think is the significance of that? Why do you think she did that? Let's back up for a second. Um, does anybody, is anybody familiar with the science of anthropology? Do you know what anthropology is and what anthropology does? No? Um, anybody familiar with sociology? No sociology majors in this course? Okay. Um, so sociology is the study of human behavior, right? That's what sociology studies. Anthropology studies human beings and, and the differences in, in, in um, what I would call ethnic or cultural groups, right? This is what anthropology does. Um, one of the critiques of anthropology, I'm just called put it, I'm gonna put it point blank, put it bluntly, right? Historically, anthropology is a, is a hyper racist discipline, right? And really where anthropology got a lot of its um, backing was its ability to scientifically, and notice the air quotes, scientifically prove the superiority of those who occupy white skin, right? So they would go into Africa and do these studies. And the object of the study was to produce the intellectual and cultural inferiority of the Africans, right? They would go into indigenous communities and do studies. And the purpose of the study was to produce the um, inferiority from an intellectual standpoint and a cultural standpoint of indigenous people, right? Um, anybody heard of epigenetics? Epigenetics is the science that says because of someone's head size, right, and the size of their brain, they're smarter than this group of people, right? So the whole racial classification is something that's been situated by this science called epigenetics trying to find the biological distinctions between separate ethnic groups, okay? Um, anthropology has a very large role in the science of epigenetics. So again, with anthropology being a highly racist discipline, right? This is where Zornel Hurston's intellectual training is coming from. She's an anthropologist, okay? So another thing that anthropology is famous for is they'll go into these cultures and not speak their language, not understand the language, right? But then produce a whole study, a whole book on a culture, right? So how much could you really know about a culture by not speaking their language? Your study is gonna be very limited, right? It's gonna have a lot of missing parts because you don't even understand what they're saying, okay? So think about what I just said and think about how Zora Neale Hurston chose to write this book, right? Think about language, right? And speaking someone's language, right? Why do you think she chose to write this book in this way? Well, I would think that she chose to write it in that way to show that she understands um, like the language, but she can also like, I'm not sure if I'm right or not, but I would say that she understands it and she could possibly like also speak, I guess. I don't know if you would call it like Ebonics, but mm -hmm. like in the same style. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right, Natalia. And also what she's doing is, this is her attempt to authenticate this type of language. Um, yes, absolutely. Angelica, can you, can you speak on that a little bit more, please? Um, yeah, so while I was reading it, I kind of felt like she used the language that she did to capture everything exactly how it was, how she witnessed it, and then portray it into like a book so other people could have the same experience. So almost like a first-hand experience, but it's more of a secondary kind of thing. Between what Natalia said and what Angelica said, that's the spot on rationale right there, right? Um, to put what Angelica said in another way. As a reader, you're displaced from your home, your bedroom, your kitchen, wherever you're reading this at, and you're transported to Kissimmee, Florida, right? Like the way that this is writing, this writing is done, it engulfs you in the language. It engulfs you in the setting, right? It places you in the South. 
And when you get into next week's reading with Baldwin, he has an uncanny ability to do the same thing, right? So you're absolutely right. It's to situate you in her reality, right? Think about what her project is. She's gonna go down to the South for a year, sit amongst the people where she grew up and just observe their conversations and write them down, right? So to translate or to place her narrations in, in a standard English, right? You lose an element of that authenticity. Right. And then to do that at a certain degree, it makes her no different than the standard anthropologist who will come in, interpret what they think is going on, and then write their notes in their language. Right. Also, this makes me think the way this is written, it makes me think about the audience. Right. Who is Zornell Hurston's audience for this particular book? Right. Who would have access to this book? with the language that it was written in. What do you guys think the, 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 the audience is for this text? The younger generation? Why you say that, Ishayu? Because I think I know why, but I'm curious to know why you feel it's the younger generation. Of the slang. Okay. Um, I'll give you that. Um, for me, I was more so thinking when I thought about the younger generation, um, because the information being passed down, right? And the dynamics at play within the text, the older, the elders are always, always speaking to the younger generation, right? And then the critique of the younger generation is y'all don't want to listen. You don't want to listen. So let me tell you how this really works, right? So that's why I thought about it being the, um, the younger generation. And I, and I think also, Ishayu, that makes more sense in R now, right? Like, as you get older, you don't typically talk in slang, unless you're me, I guess. Um, but there's more of that distinction between a generation who uses slang and generation that doesn't now than it was back in 1935 in the South, right? Um, everyone talked like that. Has anybody been to the South? Like Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, um, Alabama, nobody. So um, yeah, it, it's dialectically speaking, not dialectically, from the dialect that's being spoken in the South, it's vastly different, right? Like they about cut off half the word, right? So you have butter. You At best, you might get butter, right? Like, so this is the distinction in the way that they speak in the South, right? I spent um, a semester in Tennessee and I, it was literally like being, hearing a different language. Like I literally had to ask people all the time to repeat themselves because I, I couldn't understand what the fuck they were saying, right? Like that's just the distinction of that self. And a lot of it is more aligned with what you read within the text, right? Um, shit, they told me I talk white, right? Just because from California, there's no, you know what I mean? We, we, we will say the full word, right? Well, I'm gonna say butter, right? you know what I mean? Like it's not butter, it's butter, right? But so to them, that's a, a speaking in the standard vernacular English. Right. So there's these subtle nuances. So think about, too, how um, funds of knowledge was defined. Right. How knowledge and cultural nuance. Right. So that distinction from black folks in California saying butter and black folks in the South saying butter, that's a nuance within the culture. Right. So funds of knowledge allows those nuances to be passed down. Zornel Hurston in this text is taking something that is looked at as illegitimate as far as the way that they are speaking within these pages and legitimizing it by putting it within a text that's educational, right? This is an anthropological text. Um, so question, two questions. I'll put both on the table and you guys could respond to whichever you prefer. Um, one, why do you think I assigned this reading? Um, and then two, since we have talked about the method, and you have a little bit more insight about the method, do you think that her method, her approach in this method was effective or ineffective? So one question, why would you think I assigned this? Um, two, did you find Hurston's method, the use of, the, of this language effective or ineffective? Y'all okay? 
Y'all good? Y'all sleep? I, I felt like it was a factor only because like the language, like um how I forgot who, but they said that, that the language is more um accessible, I guess, to the younger generations because because of slang. We use more of like we abbreviate when we text. I don't I don't really look I don't really like out loud, I don't really say it like how I text it, but I say in my mind. So I think in that way it's it's more like in an approachable way. But I also felt like it was done really well because um it's not it's not only like a good thing for the younger generations, but it also gives insight to like the academic world as well. So I think it was really effective in that way. And I feel like it reached a lot of audiences. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and the thing about this too, right? So she's going down to New Orleans. She's going down to Kissimmee in Polk County, Florida. If she wrote it in this academic language, would any of the people from that area be able to read that? Nah, right? That would be opaque to them. So just as confusing as this was to us, imagine these people who speak like this trying to read a highly theoretical academic text, right? That it would be just as much as confusing, right? So again, this question of audience, right? That's why I said, hmm, this made me think about the audience because with Angelica saying access, right? What's accessible to whom? And the way that this is written is accessible to the people who she derived these stories from, right? And what we find often in the academy is we'll use the subaltern or the marginalized um, or the um, underprivileged, right? We'll use them for case studies, for sociological inquiries, right? But we'll never make that material accessible to them. It's written in a language that they can't even understand, but they're the subject matter, right? So there's an ethics at play here, right? Like how you're, you're pimping my culture, you're pimping my situation, to get yourself published, but you're using my plight, right? But not even making it accessible to me, right? So this is also kind of a critique of that method of academic pr practice, right? So if I'm gonna investigate a people, right? I'm gonna make sure that this text is, is accessible to the people who I'm investigating, right? If I'm gonna do a, um, a case study of Africans in Mexico, right? Of black folks in Mexico, it would behoove me to write that in Spanish, right? Because that's what the majority of them will speak, right? So this is what Hurston is doing. She's situating her research herself within the people who she's researching, right? Uh, yeah. So yes, you're you're, you're absolutely right, Eshaou. Um, well. Yes, so far as the, the why, right? So far as the, um, excuse me, not the why, but the what, right? I remember I said, there's two ways to engage a reading, the what is being said and the how, right? So for me, the what within this text is that element of funds of knowledge that Ishaibu was talking about, right? How the elders are able to pass down these stories, even though they're trivial, right? Um, at, a certain, at a certain level, learning how to sit in front of the fire becomes obsolete because we got heaters, right? So you don't need to really know that. You know what I mean? So, but what also for me, and the reason why I signed it is the method, right? Is the how. That, that's the real reason why I signed this text is to get you guys to think about how a text is produced, to get you to think about how, once you start writing, how are you going to write, right? What is your voice gonna sound like, right? And that's, that's, that's the main reason why I signed this. Um, and to get you to be courageous in the sense of not having to feel entrapped by academic language. Does that make sense? So there's a creativity at play within this text, right? Um, and, and I would imagine that she had a very hard time getting this published. I'm sure if I were to research that, she probably had to go through a, a, a lot of publishers to get this book out because of the language, right? And it's again, it's a critique and almost a middle finger to the academy, right? Like there's all this going on within this community also that you guys don't want to recognize, but there's valuable information and cultural nuance here. 
who else has thoughts on either was the method effective? Um, anything about the reading? Okay, I'll put this question on the table. We're thinking about the framework of funds of knowledge. Can anybody provide me examples in your personal experience of a funds of knowledge, something that you've learned from generations that's been passed down to you? Another way to think about it, is there something that your parents taught you that you would be sure to pass down to your children when you have them or if you have them already? For me, it's language. Um, my family taught me Spanish, so that's something that I'm definitely going to pass on to my children. And also, like, uh, having the ability to to speak, understand, and, you know, know how to read and everything, navigate the, the Spanish language. Um, it's also brought me a lot of knowledge, like, about my community as well, because, you know, it's not the same, like, if, like, it wouldn't be the same experience if I didn't know Spanish compared to actually knowing it and understanding it. Um, look, let me ask you, Natalia, what do you think would be lost if you did to, what, so what do you think that your children would lose if you didn't pass down to them the ability to speak Spanish? Uh, I actually mentioned it in one of my journals, but I, I mentioned that I feel like if you don't learn like the language of your, of your community, of your culture, I feel like you're in a way losing like a part of your own culture. And I feel like even a part of yourself because it's something really important. And I know, and one of the past, I well, the reading from last week, um, I know that's one of like the main important things to the author was um, language. So I think that if you don't have that, that's like you're either, you're missing out or you're losing that part of your community, of yourself. Yeah, um, so because what you mentioned about last week's reading, right, and Googie, that's what he says, right? The language a community cho chooses to speak defines who they are, right? And this is what Natalia yeah. saying, it's exactly the same thing, absolutely. Um, anybody else, what, what have you learned from your previous generation that you will make sure to pass on to your children? I think some stuff that I learned is on uh, our like traditions and um, and and also um language, but um uh, I feel like it's it's more of a thing to to keep like with like within generations because because we're else like like uh, yeah we start to we start to lose culture and like what and like what happens if in the future one of those generations like they they begin to be, become curious of how can we don't do this this thing anymore? How we should do this thing, and it's more. I think it it'd be a lot harder in the future because like since like because if you're if I were to lose like my culture and my language, it'd be really hard for like someone someone else to who who live who knew all this um to teach to teach them. Like it's kind of like like the way about that i think about it is one of the readings i'm i forgot which which reading it was but it was about the it was about the author who got taken at a young age and then when he tried to go back like they they didn't let him so he had to work his way back into that culture i feel yeah i feel like yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a really good comparison jack right so what he's talking about is the um a water and spirit reading Right, and, and Maladoma Patrice Ome was stolen from the Dagara community, put into the priest um, missionary schools. And then when he returned back, he had to go through a ritual and a rites of passage to situate his spirit, right? To get his spirit back aligned with the African way of thinking, the African way of living, right? And so what Jack is saying is that these things don't get passed down, right? You lose your sense of self. Um, I think that also kind of speaks to the part of that reading where Somme says, you know, when I've been away for so long, I need to go home and get a spiritual bath, right? To kind of wash off all this westernized thinking that I've been exposed to. Uh, very good point. Anybody else, anything that you would pass down to your children that your parents passed down to you? Um, cultural nuance, right? 
uh, Nakai, has your parents ever told you you have to be twice as good as everyone else to be recognized? Honestly, no. No? Okay. Um, so that, and the reason I brought this up and the reason I put you on the spot, bro, I don't mean to do that to you, but you're the only black person in the room, right? So the um, that is a common thing within black folks, right? Your parents will tell you, or my parents definitely told me, my grandparents told me, right? To be recognized, you have to be twice as good as everyone else because the signifier of your skin won't provide you certain access to certain areas, right? So is this, it's not gonna work to be average because you're already set behind because of your skin color, right? So you have to be extraordinary just to be recognized, just to be looked at, right? And this is a, a, a common notion. This is a funds of knowledge that gets passed down in black community, right? Um, and, and maybe it, it's, it's being severed um, because Nakai didn't get that message, which, which may be a good thing, right? Maybe the, the consciousness around our, our ability to move within the society is shifting. Um, what about food, right? Like that's an important element of, of a cultural nuance, right? Is there any cooking methods that your parents have instilled in you that you wanna make sure that your, your children have, right? That's another thing that people don't really look at or value as a component of culture that's vastly important, right? Like that situates your diet, right? Like which would determine your health, right? So there's a lot of things that go into this notion of food. Um, but yeah, any other things that you guys could think of that you would pass down to your um, younger generation? I would say for me, like how you mentioned food, I, I would say not really what type of food to cook. Um, yes, I would like to pass that on too, but like I would age to cook because I started cooking at a very young age. And my mom always explained to me, it's not because I want you to cook for someone else, but when you're older, you'll learn how to cook. And I guess that's why I see, because I know many people my age that don't know how to cook for themselves. So when my mom's not around, like obviously I know how to prepare food for myself. And that's something I would want to pass on to my children. Absolutely. Yeah, that and, and right, not only from a cultural standpoint, but just from a standpoint of um, survival, right? Like <laughs> if you out and you can't cook for yourself, that's going to make things a lot harder, right? And you're going to be dependent on um, grocery stores. You're going to be dependent on fast food, right? And it's going to make your living situation a, a lot more um, difficult to navigate. Um, who was just like completely confused? Go, go ahead, Natalia, speak on it. Uh, something that I definitely passed on also to my children is uh, music. That's something that has always, well, it's always been really Im important to me, but especially like more now. And also, um, I don't know exactly how to call it, but like, um, like, I guess the the where like of my um, of my community, like how we dress. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'd also pass down. Like for at least from my dad's side, that's really present. Like um, he, uh, well, we're Mexican, so he dresses uh, like really. Um, I don't know how to say it, but like. Say it, so am I making sense? Say it in Spanish. Oh, well, he's he he dresses like a vaquero. I don't know what that means, but it's just it's funny to me how like you can't find the words, but you know the word in Spanish, right? And, and to me, like, yeah, in at least it's in this like space. A cowboy. okay, gotcha, gotcha. But um, in this space, for my dual language speakers, feel comfortable using that other language, right? Like, even if I don't get that shit, it's cool, like. But use that, right? That's it's, it's an importance to that, and I'm sure somebody within this class understood what you meant, right? So um, I, I I did that as a perp on purpose to kind of exercise this ability to um, again be comfortable, right? Like that's a cultural um, funds of knowledge that you pass down that you disavowed in that moment, right? Because you and, and you find yourself looking for the word, but you had the word, it just wasn't in English. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, yeah, I was trying to, I was like, I know what I'm trying to say, but I don't know what word to use. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I literally, I seen that going on inside your head. You know what I mean? That's why I asked, like, yo, just say it, say it in Spanish. It's cool. Um, there's value in it, in that, right? Um, but, but I think music is, is, is a really good point. Um, and, and I know for me and my upbringing, like, I'm 37, right? So um, 90s was like, you know, really when I was coming to age, 
Um, but I had a very, very keen sense of um, mu music from like the 50s and 60s because of my, my parents, right? Um, yeah. Fridays, Saturdays, we was on our chores. Fridays, Saturdays, while you're doing chores, you listen to oldies, right? Um, so the Temptations, Isley Brothers, right? All these old school groups, that's part of my, that's part of my Sunday now, right? So on Sundays I play that and now my kids are inheriting the same music. Um, I don't know if you probably can't see behind me, but I have like a whole record collection, right? whole stacks of records passed down from my auntie, right? Old jazz vinyls, Duke Ellington, Ray Charles, Nancy Wilson, right? Like these old standard jazz standards, right? There's something that's passed down from my generation to my generations to me. Um, on Friday nights, if we weren't cleaning, it would be it would be movie night at our house, right? And what my mom would have us do is we watch these old movies from the '60s: Cooley High, um, Claudine, um, Uptown Saturday Night with Bill Cosby, right? So my my cultural vantage point stands stems from the 1950s and '60s all the way to my now because of my parents, right? Um, and it's funny because when I hear rap music, when I was hearing rap music coming up, the samples, you guys know what a sample is, right? Like you'll take a sample from one song and you'll flip it to make it into a, a more contemporary song. I always picked up on samples because I always listened to old music, right? So when, when I heard certain songs, I'm like, oh shit, that's the Icy Brothers, right? Because I had that cultural information passed down to me, right? Um, so it, Music and, and culture within itself, right? The, the aesthetic, how you dress, right? Passing that down. These things that, that don't get recognized, but are vastly important. Um, look at yeah. that, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, yeah, um, that's also something that uh, my family would always do. Like my dad, um, he would always, sometimes he wouldn't really like um, tell us to come watch it, but he'd have like an old movie playing. Um, and we would watch it with him or even now like when I was younger I didn't really like listen to music as much but now I do and I found myself going back to like those old songs that my dad would play when I was younger and like old music yeah no absolutely I, I completely agree um I'll look at the chat Dulce had, had some um said some things do you want to put that you want to speak on that Dulce this is a really good point uh yeah uh, so something that I would pass on to my children would be the morals that I've been taught. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I've been grown in a Christian household. So for me, I have different beliefs and, um, and morals. And, you know, sometimes we've seen like some people don't, don't have that respect or stuff like that. So I would like my children to have that too. So that's something that for me, it's important to pass on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I tell my kids all the time, right? Like, please, thank you, excuse me, will open mad doors for you, right? Just because it's being eradicated, man. Like nobody uses manners anymore. They're just simple manners, right? Like you bump into somebody say, excuse me. It's like, it's not that difficult, but it's not a common thing anymore, right? Um, so so I, I definitely agree with the values. It's, it's very important. Um, okay, is there any last minute comments, questions, or concerns? Um, Zaria, why don't you close us out for today? Anything you thought about the reading or anything that was discussed today that you want to comment on? Well, overall, like we were talking about beliefs and all, and like what we would pass down, and I agree with everyone, like I would pass down my, um, the beliefs I grew up with and um, like Natalia says, she grew like her parents grew up, her dad um, dresses like a vaquero. And that's something I grew up with, with like that's how my dad is as well. And before, like I was trying to pick, build myself into someone I wasn't trying to fit into the standards of society, right, that we're living right now. But like now that I see a lot of um, kids my age or even older, they're embracing how who they are, where they come from. And that's something I've, I've like learned to like appreciate and not to like hide that part of myself and um, embrace it. And I, I wish to pass that down to my future generations. And, and as a parent, right? Um, Cause I don't, I don't know how many of y'all, I don't think anybody's parents in here, I'm not sure. 
Um, but as a parent, the best way to do that is to exhibit it yourself, right? Like one thing about kids, you could tell them all day and they may not pick it up, but they watch what you do, right? And if they see you valuing their culture, then they'll value the culture as well, right? Um, again, like Natalia was saying, right? Like my dad wasn't like, yo, come sit down and watch this, but he had it on, right? Which caused me to have interest in it. So I, I think, and really not only with children, but in life period, right? What you do is a lot more effective than what you say, right? And um, oftentimes, especially with religious folks, right? What they say they're about isn't aligned with the religion that they espouse to, right? So again, the, um, the behavior, how you act, how you treat people sets the precedent above what you say, right? So you can say, oh, I'm, I'm about this, I'm about this, but if your behavior isn't aligned, nobody's gonna buy that. And I, and I think why you see that so prevalent with children is because children, they speak the truth, man. They're, like I would say, the truth comes from the mouth of babes, right? They ain't gonna lie. <laughs> they're going if you look crazy, they're gonna tell you you look crazy. That shit don't fit. They're gonna tell you that shit don't fit, right? Um, so the your actions, absolutely, your actions are, are way more powerful than words, absolutely. Okay, so we'll end it there. Um, let me show you guys what the reading is for next week. Give me one second. So next week will be, um, anybody heard of or familiar with James Baldwin? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, so we'll, 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 for those who are not familiar, you'll be introduced to James Baldwin um, for this coming week. Um, one of my favorite writers. Um, the text will be going to meet the man. And keep in mind there's three separate PDFs but they're all one reading, okay? So I think it goes like um, one, no, that's not one, let me go back. Yeah, so that's the first PDF, that's the second PDF, and then that'll be the third PDF. So um, it's three of them, but they're all one text. So you only need one journal for this reading. Um, it is a little bit um, explicit. It, it deals with a, a very traumatic um, subject matter. It's talking about a lynching. So just kind of trigger warning, right? Be prepared for that. Um, but again, another brilliantly written piece of work. Um, yeah, so, so kind of give yourself some time. It's a little bit longer, but it's not as opaque as what we just read because the language is more straightforward. So you don't have to really worry about the deciphering of the language. Um, our midterms. So let me pull up the syllabus real quick. So we're currently in this section here, um, folklore. So we just finished this. We'll read this next week. Um, we probably won't do Toni Morrison. Um, what we'll probably do is do a, um, midterm review. After that will be spring break, I believe. And then when we get back, it will be the midterm. So just kind of anticipate that. But but don't stress about it. Um, the midterm review, it will make you guys prepared for the midterm. Um, it's It will be five essay questions. Um, you'll be only responsible for answering three of the five questions. Um, but so for example, for, for one question, it may sound like this, okay? Um, how old are African people? Name a significant individual prior to European contact and their contributions. And why is this information important in the world of academia, right? So that's three questions within one question, right? So I'm gonna look for you to answer each component of that question. And I'll be looking for you to use a theoretical framework, right? So we know we have two theoretical frameworks so far. We have African-American male theory, and then we have funds of knowledge, which we covered today, right? So I want you to use those frameworks to answer the question. So it may sound like this, um, using African-American male theory as a theoretical framework, African people can be traced back 8 million years. 
Uh, Mansa Musa is a significant individual prior to European contact. He was the richest man on the planet still to this day. And that information becomes important because it can shift the way that people perceive African history dating beyond enslavement, right? So you see how I use the framework. I answered each component of the question, right? And to me, doing that will give you a, a response, right? I, I don't care about how long it is, but I do care that you use a theoretical framework and you engage each component of those questions. But again, don't stress yourself out about it. Uh, focus on Baldwin. Um, once we get through Baldwin, we'll spend a whole class session doing a, a review and then um, we'll have a break and then we'll, we'll have the midterms. Um, is there any questions from anybody? Nope, all right. Well, I, I have two questions. Right. Um, regarding the fish bowls, is it possible for us to do more than two if everyone has had a chance? And um, point or grade wise, could it count for any like saying like if we feel that we didn't do our best on one? Um, so yes, to answer your first question, yes. Um, Denise, I don't, as far as your second question, I haven't heard anybody not do the fishbowl right, to be honest with you. I, I, I haven't, um, and, and really, I don't even, I can't even think about a way to do the fishbowl wrong, unless you like say, I'm gonna do it and don't say shit, right? That's like the only thing I, I could think of. Um, so I wouldn't really worry about, you know, trying to make up for missed points in the fishbowl. If you're doing it, you're doing it right. Right. Even if it's even if it's something to where I don't even want to say wrong, because I, I really don't think it's about a right or wrong. It's just about engaging in conversation. Right. And sometimes misinterpretations lead to new re re revelations and new understanding. So I, it's not really a, a wrong way to do it. Um, so does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK. Um, any other questions? All right, well, you guys um, enjoy this rain. Um, get some water, get, be healthy, try to exercise. Um, enjoy your weekend, and I will see you all next Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. All right, peace. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good one.